Welcome. My name is Antonia and I'm the Regional Curator for the National Trust for Scotland. This is a brief look at the rise of the photo studio in 1850s Aberdeen and who were some of the winners and the losers in this economic bubble. The first studio we know about in Aberdeen was a business set up in 1842 by a Mr Watson and Mr Fannin. Aberdonians were invited to their studio on 79 Union Street to obtain a daguerreotype, a photographic portrait on metal. They advertised specifically to the nobility and gentry, announcing that the hand of nature itself makes your likeness so real it will dazzle you. The cost was a whopping one pound one shilling, which is roughly 122 pounds today. A boom in the studio business really began when photographs could be made and purchased for pennies rather than pounds and shillings. Two key things happened in the early 1850s. In 1851, a new chemical process called colloidium was made, which made it quicker and easier to sensitise glass plates and develop prints. And in 1854, the small format carte de visite arrived from Paris, so images became cheaper to produce. By the 1860s, most people, from the Queen to a factory worker, could obtain a photographic portrait, which for the first time allowed people to visually connect themselves to the wider world. Before the carte de visite, Aberdeen studios were few and far between. Apart from Fannin and Watson, the only recorded studio in 1851 was run by Ernst Donald on Thistle Street. Before 1851, Ernst was a meat curer. He tried his hand at photography for a few years and, like many, did not make his fortune. He went back to his old job six years later and then became a clerk to a hide and cattle salesman. Why on earth would a meat curer become a photographer? Well, first, the camera provided huge possibilities for making money off people's desire to look at themselves. But the other reason is peculiar to Aberdeen. Ernst was on the committee of the Mechanics Institute. The president was a chemist working at King's College who had lectured on photography in the early days. Ernst would submit 12 photographs to an exhibition organised when a large travelling display of photographs came to Aberdeen in 1853 from the Society of Arts in London. It was an exhibition designed to promote the art of photography and was seen by the committee as an opportunity to highlight Aberdonian talent. By 1853, Aberdeen had a burgeoning merchant class and ranked third behind Edinburgh and Glasgow as Scotland's wealthiest urban centre. It had a booming retail and hotelier trade, as well as a thriving port and shipbuilding industry. The Aberdeen Mechanics Institute had been established in the 20s to educate tradesmen. But by the 1850s, it had morphed into a business networking centre. It so happens that many of the Institute's committee members in 1853 were interested in the trade of photography. Ernst Donald was just one of them. James Hay was another and was also on the committee. He had a shop on Market Street, very conveniently placed outside the exhibition. Hay's business offered carving, gilding, picture restoration and frame making. Plus they sold mathematical, scientific and philosophical instruments. These were the businesses that sold photographic equipment, materials and prints. In 1853, when James is helping the committee organise the photo exhibition, his brother John Hay is in the process of setting up a new photographic business with George Washington Wilson. In 1853, Wilson is still a portrait painter and drawing teacher, but this is the moment he starts the shift into the photography business, which will make him very rich as he becomes one of the most prolific 19th century studio photographers in Scotland. Wilson and Hay submitted 22 calotype portraits, two landscapes and several stereoscopic images to the 1853 exhibition in Aberdeen, just months after they had become partners. This advert from the following year shows how the exhibition has given them confidence. Wilson has been to Paris for the latest equipment and has returned ready to take portraits 
landscapes and people's houses. Also note that they were under the immediate patronage of Queen Victoria, who in 1853 had begun the rebuilding of Balmoral, and probably thanks to the medals Hay and Wilson had won in the exhibition, Victoria commissioned them to take photographs documenting work on the estate. Wilson and Hay's competition included John Lamb, who submitted 12 photographs and won three medals in the 1853 exhibition. Lamb opened a permanent studio on 233 George Street that year and placed an advert in the Aberdeen Journal around the time of the exhibition in December. He announced that his photographs were available from three local retailers, including John Duncan, a jeweller, and Kerr and Bowman, carvers, gilders, and print sellers. This illustrates two things. First, there is a lucrative distribution network for commercial photography. In other words, many people were invested in the new trade. And second, new commercial studios used the reputation of longer standing businesses to establish themselves with clientele. Adverts were important and they were used by photographers for decades. The key ways of attracting clients was to mention your knowledge of up-to-date chemistry, note that you were artistic, highlight your reliability, your range of services and your commodious premises. Mason marks were also helpful. Studios were being defined as safe places for the middle classes, off the street and away from the nefarious traders who were offering cheap photography. A subject that touches on a Victorian fascination and fear of itinerants and outsiders. Another photographer riding on the coattails of the exhibition in 1853 was James Bissett. He was only 23 when he set up a studio on Exchange Street near the Market Hall and the Mechanics Institute, which in themselves were close to the train station and the harbour. His business focused on the cheaper end of the market for portrait photographs, surviving well into the 1880s and ending up on Young Street further north. Ironically, it's Donald's studio, which had closed only after a few years, that was probably the best placed for wealthier clients. This is on the west side, where larger houses and wide streets were laid out in the 1820s. And this is where Wilson had already set up a studio as a teacher. And when he turned to photography, he knew that it was a location suitable for an upper middle class audience. Only a few years after establishing himself, Wilson uses old portrait negatives to develop an innovative montage of Aberdeen worthies. This cleverly catered to the desires of a middle-class citizen who wished to be seen belonging and participating in the public sphere. Wilson's 1857 photo montage was marketed for six shillings, it's about 55 pounds now. It proved an unprecedented success, so much so that Wilson was at first unable to keep up with the demand. The men chosen for the print were a mixture of professionals, business traders, clergy and landed gentry. Wilson positioned certain people front and centre, others on the margins, grading society in a way that illustrates the rise of the trade and professional classes in Aberdeen. The most prominent figure in the centre of the composition, for instance, is the provost, Sir Thomas Blakey, who was the son of a plumber and had built one of the largest ironworking engineering companies in the area. The Royal Academy painter, John Philip, who was the son of a shoemaker, was given a similar central prominence, as were the wealthy industrialists of Duthie's shipyard, John Duthie and his son. Some of the smallest faces were of James and William Fordyce, the lairds of Brockley Castle, a 20,000 acre estate north of Aberdeen. Their faces pale in comparison to their middle class neighbours, perhaps suggesting that the Fordyce's influence in contemporary urban affairs was comparatively marginal. Depicting what looks like an exclusive club became a promotional image for Wilson's studio, 
It lured in aspiring customers, eager to join such an illustrious group, and he produced a second montage the following year. Wilson also had an advantage over his competitors as photographer to the Queen, marketing this royal connection even before he was officially granted the title in 1861. This was actually the year of Albert's death, and Wilson was invited back to Balmoral to take a series of images of the family in mourning. He was given copyright permission and made hundreds of pounds just with this image alone. 13,000 carte de visites were sold in 1864 when this picture was first published. Even though Wilson dominated the market, as the chemistry and apparatus of photography improved and became cheaper, the cost of starting a studio was becoming less expensive, and the number of entrepreneurs entering the field increased. By 1857, there were five studios. Three newcomers have joined Lamb and Wilson. On Union Street was Frederick, a German photographer who specifically called himself an artist and claimed over 10 years of experience in taking photos. He also offered the services of, quote, an ornamental hair department managed by his wife. The other two, Dalgano and Nisbet, set up studios opposite one another on Market Street, right next to the Mechanics Institute. The following year, the number increases from five to seven. The two new practitioners were Andrew Adams. He'd been a cabinet maker and a Wright before advertising his services as a photographer in 1857. He set up opposite Marischal College on Broad Street. He shared Retty's Court with a chemist, a hairdresser and booksellers, as well as James Retty himself, whose father had set up Retty's Jewellers in 1824. The second newcomer was Henry Gordon, who promoted himself as a photographer who could deliver portraits in a first-class style and offered opening hours from 10am until dusk. Gordon chose his location for its proximity to the South Railway Station, presumably hoping to catch those travellers coming and going from the city. It is worth noting that other companies did trade photographs for larger firms that operated outside of Aberdeen. For example, Gifford and Son, who were a carving and gilding business, they were also agents for the London Stereoscopic Company. They also sold John Lamb's photographs and opened their own portrait studio on 187 Union Street. As we move into a new decade, the post office directory notes seven more registered studios. Six of the 14 are next to or on Market Street and five go west along Union Street. Over the next three years, many more join the trade. Studios are taken over from previous owners. Jay Wood has taken on Nesbitt's on 25 Marketplace, while William Gary has come from Washington Wilson's studio to set up his own business on Windmill Bray. Also, John Lamb has moved almost next door to Wilson's portrait studio on Crown Street. So in just 10 years, we've gone from four businesses in 1854 to 26 in 1864. Jumping forward, the 1881 census lists over a hundred people as working in a photography studio in some capacity in the city of Aberdeen, either as owners, assistants, managers, cutters, colorists, printers, or retouchers. It was usual for photographers to move many times, their names coming in and out of the post office directories. John Cragen is a good example of this. He moved several times over roughly 40 years. John Lamb is, has also moved numerous times, ending up on South Silver Street in the 1880s. The city of Aberdeen in 1881 had more women working in photography studios than all the surrounding counties combined. 70 men and 34 women were recorded in the 1881 census. The trades that women were working in were varied. Five women were listed as photographers, 20 as assistants. Other jobs included bookkeeping, 
colouring photographs and printing. Women, principally, were cheaper to hire and considered better at the detailed work. Wilson was one of the first to turn a studio into a manufacturing business. He employed women, seen here, who were paid over 40% less than their male equivalents. Statistics from Edinburgh at the time has shown that skilled women earned roughly the same as unskilled men and young boys, an average of 20 shillings a week. These women pictured here were probably on a lot less, maybe as little as eight shillings a week, but Wilson's male assistants would be earning as much as a pound a week. Other women entered the trade by inheriting it from their husbands or their fathers. Two of John Lamb's daughters were listed as photographic assistants in 1881. His eldest, Helen, is listed as an artist. To conclude, these studios that survived did so because they understood their middle-class audiences, most of whom wished to be pictured as a successful part of bourgeois life. In Aberdeen, the rise of the studio can be traced to an exhibition in 1853 that was designed to elevate the art and the business of photography at a time when the city's merchant class was on the rise.